From Washington, D.C., good morning, friends and comrades. My name is Mohsin Siddiq. I work with the Education Commission of the Communist Party USA. It is a great honor and privilege to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Prabhat Patnaik. Dr. Prabhat Patnaik is an eminent economist, a beloved teacher, and a respected global public intellectual. Yes, he does, quote, inter interpret the world, but if you are familiar with his body of work, just Google him, you would know that he is very much engaged in the language of the 11th thesis on Feuerbach in quote unquote, ch changing the world. He's an activist in the Communist Party of India, Marxist, some of the leaders of the party, including the current General Secretary, Sitaram Yachuri, were his students at one time. Communist Party in India have been participating in the democratic process for some time now. After winning the state of Kerala in 2004, the left Democratic Front appointed him as the vice chairman of the Kerala State Planning Board, where he was from June 2006 to May 2011. Instead of following the traditional development model, investing in large projects, the emphasis was placed on increasing the income of the population. This is very popular because it improved the quality of life of the, of the people. It is the only state in India with 100% literacy, best health care for the ordinary citizens, and varieties of public services. Of all the 29 states in India, it is the least impacted by COVID-19 because of their early planning and preparation. Dr. Patnaik was part of the high power task force of the United Nations to recommend reform measures for global financial system. Chaired by Joseph Stiglitz, the other members of the task force were Belgian sociologist Francois Mutard and Ecuador's Prime Minister of Economic Policy, Pedro Paez. Professor Patnaik was born in 1945 to parents who were engaged in the anti-colonialist struggles against the British. His father was a communist member of the, the Legislative Assembly. He earned BA and MA in economics from St. Stephen's College, Delhi, with first class in both. In 1966, he went to Oxford University on a road scholarship and studied Balliol College and later at Nuffield College. There he earned his Bachelor of Philosophy and a Doctor of Philosophy degrees. In 1969, Patnaik joined the Faculty of Economics and Politics at the University of Cambridge in UK and was elected a fellow of the Clare College. In 1974, he returned to India as an associate professor at the newly established Center for Economic Studies and Planning at the Zohar Nehru University in Delhi. He became a professor at the center in 1983 and taught there till his retirement in 2010. The list of books he has written, some with his wife, Dr. Usha Patnaik, also a well-known Marxist economist, is long and are included in the write-up on him in the Wikipedia. Some of the books to be mentioned are The Capital and Imperialism, a theory of imperialism, the value of money, Marxist capital and interpretation, accumulation and stability under capitalism, an appeal, Lenin and imperialism, an appeal, and an appraisal of theories and contemporary reality, and the and the invention of socialism. He's a highly demand, he's in highly demand in especially among young people in, 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 in activists in India. Let us welcome Professor, Professor Patnaik to speak on a to speak on a very disturbing development. The resurgence of fascist tendencies all around the world. Dr. Patnaik. Thank you very much, Comrade Miles, Comrade Siddiq, comrades and friends. It's an honor for me to have been asked to speak at this class uh, on neoliberalism and neo-fascism. Uh, when we talk of neoliberalism, what we have in mind is a regime in which there is relatively free flow, unrestricted flow of goods and services and of capital, including finance across country borders. Now, this is a relatively recent development because the immediate post-war period was characterized by a different international economic regime, which was set up at the Bretton Woods uh, conference. It's called the Bretton Woods system. Uh, and the Bretton Woods system was one in which countries were allowed to and did put up barriers against the free imports of commodities or against certainly on cap they, they 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 put up capital controls against the free movements of capital across borders but within the Bretton Woods system a number of things happened the first thing that happened was 
that the United States played the role of the leading imperial power in the world. In order to play that role, it set up bases all around the globe and to meet the expenditures on those bases, the United States uh, ran a persistent current account deficit in the balance of payments. Now, this was possible because the dollar was sanctified as being as good as gold under the Bretton Woods system. In fact, it was convertible to gold at $35 per ounce of gold. And therefore, the United States effectively was simply printing dollars to meet its expenditures elsewhere, which all other countries were more or less forced to hold. These dollars found their way eventually to various banks, particularly European and American banks. And of course, therefore, there was an enormous buildup of liquidity in the world economy. When there was this buildup of liquidity, the banks wanted to use it to make profits. And therefore, there was a revolt against the Bretton Woods system where they did not want barriers against the free flow of finance, free flow of capital across the globe. And they wanted these barriers removed. And the barriers were, in fact, removed with the collapse of the Bretton Woods system in 1973. First, the gold dollar link was snapped by Nixon in 71. And of course, in 1973, the Bretton Woods system itself collapsed and was followed, therefore, by the emergence of what we know today as a neoliberal regime. The neoliberal regime is basically, therefore, characterized by relatively unrestricted flows of capital and finance across country borders, as well as of goods and services. Now, this, however, creates a very peculiar situation. On the one hand, you have finance and capital that is globalized. It can move from one, one country to another at a moment's notice. On the other hand, each country is characterized by its own particular nation state. Therefore, you have international capital, but nation states. Now, because of this, every nation state is more or less willy-nilly uh, forced to follow policies, economic policies, which are dictated by globalized finance, which are demanded by globalized finance, which are to the liking of globalized finance. And this is something which newspapers refer to as retaining the confidence of the investors, because those investors are basically all kinds of financial interests, and therefore economic policy has to be tailored to the the caprices of those financial interests. Now, this has very profound implications, of course, politically. It has profound implications for democracy, because what it means is that democracy is supposed to mean the sovereignty of the people. As a matter of fact, you find that in a country that is formally democratic, but that is inserted into this world of free flow of globalized finance. Basically, the policies it pursues are dictated by finance. So sovereignty of globalized finance replaces the sovereignty of the people. And therefore, it, it, it entails a significant attenuation of democracy. Even when you have governments which are elected on the promise of pursuing policies which are to the benefit of the people, when they come to power, they actually renege on those policies. And that is something which is not because they are malicious, but, but it is something which is objectively forced upon them as long as they remain within this whirlpool of finance, they can hardly do anything else. And that being the case, it becomes essential to drop out of the whirlpool of finance if you want to pursue some alternative pro-people policies. But on the other hand, that brings enormous transitional costs 
because finance is going to flow out of the country. And that being the case, uh, uh, the country would be faced with a financial crisis. And what is more, even if you can weather this financial crisis, even if you have the courage to actually withstand this financial crisis, you have the United States and other advanced capitalist countries imposing sanctions upon you. And of course, when that happens, then it becomes even very difficult for you to trade with other countries. Therefore, the transitional pains of getting out of this regime are fairly high. And because of that, most most political formations uh, uh, really find it difficult to do that and therefore they more or less are caught uh, uh, you know they, they they're caught appeasing finance they're caught respecting the sovereignty of finance as opposed to the sovereignty of the people now that is one part of the story uh, its implication for democracy which i should not go into but the other part of the story is actually what happens in the realm of economic policy. Post Second World War, all these countries, third world countries and, and even first world countries, they actually had significant state intervention in the management of the economy. These are regimes which I would call the dirigist regimes, the statist regimes, bourgeois societies, capitalist economy, building capitalism, but nonetheless building capitalism with substantial amount of state intervention. And therefore, in third world countries, state intervention also, <coughs> to an extent, also protected the interests of petty producers, the interests of peasants, and even to an extent, it protected the workers against wholesale depredations of capital. And that is something which was carried over from the colonial days, uh, days of colonial, anti-colonial struggle. A promise of anti-colonial struggle is that it is going to improve the conditions of various people, various strata, various classes in society. And therefore, to some extent, there was a protection of the peasantry. There was a protection of the working class and so on. All of which, by the way, is going now, has gone now, which is why in India, you have a massive movement of peasants at this particular moment about which I'm sure uh, everybody would be familiar. Now, therefore, the state policy becomes increasingly detached from protecting the interests of the other classes, but on the other hand, it actually promote specifically the interests of the corporate financial oligarchy domestically, which is linked to globalized finance. It is itself a part of globalized finance. It takes money out, puts money elsewhere, invests elsewhere, and so on and so forth. Now, therefore, there is a change that takes place in the nature of the state. And this change in the nature of the state actually implies a uh, enormous crisis of petty production. In India, for instance, I'll, I'll give you Indian data as illustrating the point. Between 1991, which is when our economy uh, introduced neoliberal measures, and 2011, which is the last census that we have, you find that the number of cultivators has gone down by 15 million. There are 15 million less cultivators today than there were in, in 2011 than you had in 1991. Either they became laborers, in other words, a process of pauperization, or alternatively, they migrated to the towns in search of jobs. Therefore, the crisis of petty production, the crisis of peasant agriculture is something which is across the globe. And I just give you some figures from India. But at the same time, therefore, when the number of job seekers in towns increases greatly, the number of jobs created under the neoliberal regime does not increase to any significant comparable extent. That's because, again, all kinds of restrictions which used to be placed earlier 
upon the pace of technological change are removed because after all you are an open economy now you you have to compete against other goods and therefore to the extent that they carry out technological progress you have to carry out technological progress to prevent their imports from coming in to such a great extent that you have a balance of payments crisis therefore there is much higher rate of growth of i mean rate of technological progress and as you know under capitalism technological progress essentially takes the form of labor displacement therefore even though countries in the third world like india and and and, and other countries have high rates of gdp growth because of the fact that there is a relocation of industry from the first world or activities from the first world to the third world at the same time even when you have high rates of gdp growth there are very high rates of labor productivity growth because of which employment does not increase as you know the rate of growth of employment in the capitalist sector is simply the difference between the rate of growth of gdp minus the rate of growth of labor productivity so if labor productivity increases even as gdp growth rises employment growth does not increase in fact employment growth reduces compared for instance to the dirigeist period earlier post independence in india post 1947 you had roughly about 2% every year rate of growth of employment in the organized sector today that has dropped to 1% which is even less than the natural rate of growth of the workforce therefore you have a swelling of of what marx had called the reserve army of labor now while therefore you have a swelling of the reserve army of labor all over the third world which is where the reserve army is really concentrated of course you have reserve army everywhere capitalist system cannot function without a reserve army but the size of the reserve army is fundamentally uh, uh, much greater in the third world countries where you have substantial labor reserves now while therefore the labor reserves do not disappear on the other hand they actually swell and this is in turn associated with the fact that notwithstanding high rates of growth there is an increase in absolute poverty in increase in the magnitude of absolute poverty relative to the population again i'll give you some data from india that in 1993 4 i told you that neoliberalism began in 1991 in 1993 94 the proportion of the rural population which could not even access 2200 calories per person per day which is uh, 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 the definition of poverty in india was 58% this by 2011 12 had increased to 68% for the urban population where the benchmark is 2100 calories per person per day the corresponding figures were 57% in 1993-4 and 65% in 2011-12 so there is an increase in absolute poverty obviously if people get displaced from petty production if they are pushed out into the reserve army of labor not enough jobs then there has to be an increase in poverty which is exactly what you find but there is an additional factor which is of great importance and that consists in the fact that now the wages in the advanced countries whether it is britain whether it is the united states whether it is uh, uh, germany whether it is um, uh, france the wages in the advanced capitalist countries also get constrained by the enormous mass of the reserve army of labor in the third world why because of the fact that if you have a rise in wages there then capital threatens to shift its activities to the third world because of that there is a restraint on the ability of the workers in the first world to raise their wages 
and 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 and, and for this reason, the real wages don't rise. In fact, Stiglitz made a calculation that in the United States, if you look at the average real wage of a male industrial worker in 1968, and you compared it with the average real wage of a male industrial worker in 2011, then in the second date on the second day 2011 it was marginally lower and we are talking about absolute wages therefore real wages do not rise there is a weakening of the trade union movement for this reason uh, again you know that that uh, that you find that you know that the proportion of the workforce that is um, affected by this weakening of the trade union movement. I mean, the proportion of the workforce that is unionized itself uh, tends to shrink. And this is again something which has actually happened. Uh, it tends to shrink because of privatization of activities, which is again a part of neoliberalism. In the United States, for instance, in the private sector, only about 7% of the workforce is unionized, while in the government sector, including education, you find about 30 to 31% of the total workforce is unionized. And therefore, if you have a shift from uh, uh, the government to the private sector, typically you have a fall that takes place in the proportion of the unionized work. So on the one hand, real wages do not rise anywhere. The vector of real wages, I'm not saying that the real wages in America become the same as in India or Vietnam or, 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 or Bangladesh, but the vector of real wages does not increase. On the other hand, the vector of labor productivity increases everywhere. Of course, that is exactly why I said that the labor reserve do not get used up. So if the vector of labor productivity uh, uh, rises everywhere, while the vector of real wages does not, that basically means that within individual countries, as well as taking the world as a whole, the proportion of surplus in total output increases. This is something which is a well-attested phenomenon. Many economists like Piketty and others have been talking about the rise in income inequality. Piketty measures it by looking at the share of the top 1% in the total income. 1%, 2%, 10% maximum. You know, so, 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 so you find that the share of the top 1% in total income has increased quite significantly in the neoliberal period, which of course in the advanced countries began a little early, let us say, in, in, in the 70s, in, in Latin America and Africa in the 80s and in India in the 90s. Uh, so the increase in income inequality is something which, of course, even advanced countries, I mean, even even uh, the, 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 the advanced countries, uh, government summits, which actually take place, uh, express concern about the increase in income inequality, because obviously capitalism would require to have some kind of a solidity of support. And if you have solidity of social and political support, and if you have sharp increases in income inequality, then that is something which is likely to erode that support. But the other implication of this increase in income inequality, which is what concerns me, which is basically the, uh, the other implication of the rise in the proportion of economic surplus in total output, is that, you know, that means a shift of income from wage earners uh, or from the working people to the surplus earners. Now, per unit of income, a wage earner consumes a lot more than a surplus earner. Surplus earner, primarily the capitalists and their hangers on. They tend to be rich people, lawyers, advertisement agencies, and so on, all of which then uh, have a fairly low proportion 
of their income being devoted to immediate consumption. They put the rest in their pockets to be spent the day after tomorrow. And that is what basically we refer to as savings. Therefore, the percentage of income devoted to consumption tends to be small compared to the working people who more or less spend the bulk of their income in um, in, in, in in consuming. And this is true even in advanced countries, uh, which again Piketty's data have shown that in, in France, for instance, the bottom 50% of the population owns only 5% of the total assets of the country. That basically means that they hardly save. I mean, they, 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 they hardly not consume. In, in other words, whatever income they get, they devote that income to consumption. They hardly have anything extra with which to build up assets. Savings means increase in the magnitude of assets. So you find, therefore, that a rise in the proportion of surplus in output in the world and even in every individual country is associated with a tendency towards overproduction. For any given level of investment, such an income distribution shift lowers the proportion of uh, lowers the level of consumption and therefore creates a problem of insufficient demand, creates a problem of overproduction, which makes itself felt in terms of unutilized capacity and unemployment. And of course, when this happens, investment again is also cut. And so there is a slowing down of the growth rate. This is something which is an imminent tendency of a neoliberal regime. But on the other hand, this tendency could be kept by check. In fact, for America, Paul Baran and Paul Sweezy had argued in the 1960s that, look, there was a rise in the proportion of surplus in the US output, uh, but on the other hand, in the US GDP. But this, which would otherwise have created a problem of overproduction in the US was kept in check through government spending and they are good through government military spending, which was very significant in absorbing the surplus. And therefore, the, a rise in the surplus produces a tendency towards overproduction, which, however, need not realize itself if there are counteracting measures. The most fundamental counteracting measure, of course, is state uh, expenditure. The problem with state expenditure, and this is where I come to the third feature of a neoliberal regime, is the following. Suppose the state spends $100, and if it spends $100 by taking $100 as taxes from the workers, in that case, there is no addition to demand then the state is not playing any offsetting role to the tendency towards overproduction. What the state is doing is simply taking one kind of demand or, or, or one kind of demand gets killed, that is the worker's demand, and another kind of demand takes its place. Therefore, the only way that the state can play this role of stimulating demand in the economy, acting as a countervailing force for the tendency towards overproduction is either if it spends by taxing capitalists or if it's spends by simply a larger fiscal deficit. Now, taxing capitalists or taxing surplus earners is obviously anathema as far as finance capital, globalized finance capital is concerned. And in fact, so is the is, is, is a larger fiscal deficit. Now, you may wonder why a larger fiscal deficit is frowned upon by globalized finance. But this has been a consistent characteristic of globalized finance, that it frowns upon a larger fiscal deficit. And I think the explanation for this lies not so much in economics because after all uh, the 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 point is that you know if you have actual overproduction there'll be unemployment there would be unutilized capacity there would be therefore uh, some kind 
of loss, even as far as the capitalists are concerned, some kind of a setback, not just for the workers, but also for the capitalists. The reason why it frowns upon a uh, larger fiscal deficit is, I believe that state intervention delegitimizes the capitalist system because then people begin to say that, look, this system cannot function without state intervention. And if it requires state intervention so badly, then why do, we, why do we need the capitalists? We may as well have the state running all these enterprises. In other words, such questions would begin to arise and this delegitimization of capitalism is something which is extremely repugnant to globalized finance, particularly because globalized finance consists of people, I mean, you know, consists of entities which have no direct, necessarily direct role in production. They are what Keynes had called functionless investors. They simply push money around from one place to another. And any such delegitimization therefore poses a social threat to them. So, they, they, therefore, a fiscal deficit is out. Taxing the surplus earners, the capitalists, is generally frowned upon. And for these reasons, the state cannot play the role that it did in the post immediate post Second World War period in the advanced countries and even in the third world countries for pushing up the level of demand. Therefore, the world economy does not have a counteracting, countervailing force against the tendency towards the uh, uh, towards overproduction in the absence i mean of state intervention the only remaining countervailing force is of course the formation of asset price bubbles uh, you know that that if there's an asset price bubble that gets formed in that case suddenly people feel wealthy substantially wealthier than they actually are and that in turn generates a certain amount of demand. In fact, the world economy was sustained during the 1990s by the dot-com bubble in the United States. And of course, in the earlier part of this century by the housing bubble in the United States. With the collapse of the housing bubble, no correspondingly significant bubble has actually uh, appeared and therefore the world economy has been sunk in a more or less protracted crisis. As a matter of fact, the last decade has been the decade of the slowest growth in the world economy in the entire post-Second World War period. Now, when there is this, when there's a rise in unemployment, by the way, I should say that what I'm saying may appear to be contradicted by the unemployment data of the United States, uh, which show that apparently by 2019, the US unemployment rate had come down to 3.6%. But when you look at the labor force participation rate, you find that that too had dropped. In other words, many people had dropped out of the labor force because of what is called the discouraged worker effect, because of which if you had the same labor force participation rate in 2019 as you had in 2008 when the housing bubble collapsed, then the unemployment rate in the US in 2019 would have been about 8%. The unemployment rate today in the US would be a bit more than that, 9, 9.5%, 9 but that's because of the pandemic also playing its role. But fundamentally, there has been a slowing down of the world economy and that has manifested itself in high unemployment rates all over the world or and i mean you know or in the united states in also a fall in the labor force participation rate now whenever capitalism gets into a crisis it actually can no longer rely on its old basis of political support. It needs an additional prop. And this additional prop is neo-fascism. This additional prop in the 1930s, because of the Great Depression, was in classical fascism. Unemployment rate, uh, uh, high unemployment, is what actually produced 
Hitler because what fascism does is that, you know, they are, they are fascist forces in every modern society, but they operate on the fringes of society. They are never really center stage normally. But on the other hand, in periods of economic crisis, they are propped up by monopoly capital. They are actually brought by monopoly capital to the center stage in order to change the discourse away from uh, the, 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 the bread and butter questions, away from questions of material life towards generating a hatred for the other some ethnic religious minority some ethnic religious racial minority and then that becomes the focus of attention and they therefore play the role of providing a prop for capitalism because they support capitalism and at the same time distract people's attention through a change in the discourse against the other to the extent that even they provide some discussion of the disc of, 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 of bread and butter issues, even the problems of the bread and butter issues, problems of material life are laid at the door of the other. That you have unemployment because the Chinese are stealing your jobs. You have unemployment because the Mexicans are stealing your jobs. In India, you have unemployment because the government is appeasing the Muslims and so on. So that, you know, neo-fascism today, fascism in the 1930s, is really something which emerges in a period of capitalist crisis. And of course, it emerges to change the discourse. It brings about a change in the discourse. This is exactly what I, I, you know, is happening in India. Here, the government, we have a government which is actually completely uh, riding roughshod over the interests of the peasants, over the interests of the workers, but is not worried as normally governments, even bourgeois governments under bourgeois democracy are worried that it may lose the election because it knows that come the elections, it might generate a communal riot, it might generate some kind of incident with, with some neighboring country and, in, and, and, and thereby on the basis of this shifted discourse, it would again try and get back to power there and this is very useful as far as the capitalists are concerned and this is something which again therefore you have a sort of neoliberal neo-fascist alliance whose specific form uh, uh, is in fact in, in in india for instance a corporate hindutva alliance the corporate segments are really aligned to the Hindutva forces, the forces which want a Hindu state, which actually vilify Muslims, which which vilify uh, uh, the minority, uh, the the most significant religious minority, and it is that alliance which is currently acquired hegemony, and this is true all over the globe. Somewhere they are in power, in other places they are not. But whether they are in power or not, everywhere they are in the ascendancy, whether it is France, Italy, Germany, Poland, in Poland and Hungary, of course, they are in power in the United States. When Trump was the president, he came close to it and so on. Uh, Turkey, Brazil, and so on. So that this, 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 this wave of neo-fascism, to my mind, is really symptomatic of the fact that the neoliberal economy has run into a serious crisis all over the world because of which you have the necessity for, from the point of view of capital, from the point of view of big capital, of a neoliberal neo-fascist alliance. There is, however, a big difference between the 1930s and now. And that difference consists in the fact that in the 1930s, you had, as Lenin had written, German finance capital, French finance capital, British finance capital. And therefore, when you had fascist governments coming in any of these countries, like Germany or, or like in Italy, they actually were pretty close to the finance capitals of their respective countries, and they could persuade the finance capitals to 
have much larger state expenditures financed by borrowing. In Japan, Japan was the first country to come out of the Great Depression. And in Japan, this was made possible because of military expenditures financed by government borrowing. In Germany, Hitler came to power in 1933, and immediately there was a substantial militarization drive, increased government expenditures, again financed by borrowing, and because of this, there was a fall in the unemployment rate in all these countries. Therefore, there was a brief period between the fascists coming to power in all these countries where they did come to power and the, the horrors of the war visiting these countries, during which the fascists even acquired a certain amount of popularity because they had got these countries out of the depression, they had reduced the unemployment rate and so on. But today that is not possible because of the fact, as I mentioned, that we don't have an Indian finance capital or, the, or a French finance capital. We have a global finance capital, globalized finance capital. And therefore, since globalized finance capital does not like fiscal deficits, you have the governments being constrained, even fascist governments being constrained in stimulating the economy and reducing thereby the levels of unemployment. So for this reason, even the kind of popularity that fascism in the 1930s had very briefly acquired is popularity that contemporary neo-fascism simply cannot acquire today. This has a number of implications. The first implication is that even if the fascists get out of power, it's possible that, that they may get out of power, they would remain and might even get back into power. So, so we are now left with a fascism that would be a kind of lingering, a lingering neo-fascism, which would even change over time the discourse of the liberal bourgeois parties. So, so you have a lingering neo-fascism. And this lingering neo-fascism, prospects of coming back to power would be even greater to the extent that the liberal bourgeoisie does not generate employment, does not manage to get the economy out of the crisis. And as I mentioned, because of the opposition of globalized finance to state intervention, to state spending through borrowing, you find that this is going to be very difficult for even liberal bourgeois elements. I know that in the United States, Joe Biden, the new president, has been thinking in terms of various proposals to um, stimulate the economy. But on the other hand, to what extent he succeeds remains to be seen. Uh, the belief in many liberal bourgeois quarters that all we need to do is to simply go back to the days of uh, Franklin Roosevelt and therefore enlarge government spending and, 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 and that would get us out of the economy is something which misses the point that the contemporary crisis of capitalism is because of the hegemony of globalized finance and that being the case until this hegemony is either loosened or, 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 or eliminated, even advanced countries cannot really get out of this crisis of, you know, of, of this overproduction crisis of capital. When it comes to the third world, matters are in fact much worse because of the fact that you see that, that during the pandemic, for instance, the IMF, which basically is a spokesperson of globalized finance, the IMF was talking about the fact that all countries, third world countries should enlarge their health expenditures, should actually enlarge their nursing staff, should enlarge their medical facilities and so on. But Oxfam made a study of some of the agreements. See, many third world countries are of course in serious debt. Now, during the period of the pandemic, many of them, their debts became, uh, I mean, you know, the, 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 the date for repaying the debts came and therefore they had to do something. They had to borrow from the IMF in order to roll over the debt. 
Now, in all these arrangements that the IMF made, in fact, Oxfam studies studied 91 agreements that the IMF signed with third world countries, with 81 third world countries. And it turns out that in 76 of them, there was an insistence on fiscal austerity, an insistence even on curtailing health expenditures, on curtailing the wages and salaries of nurses and doctors and so on. And therefore, in the third world, you actually find that the fiscal austerity is going to continue. So even if there is some revival in the advanced countries, though Europe is, is, is nowhere near, uh, uh, having any larger fiscal deficits, because in Europe there is a genuine fear of capital flight, financial outflows to the United States. But of course, the United States has a certain advantage because the dollar is still considered by most wealth holders to be uh, uh, the best currency to have. And that being the case, uh, the U.S. has a certain advantage that even if it runs a fiscal deficit, though we still don't know how much the fiscal deficit is going to be, that there wouldn't be much of a massive capital flight from the U.S. because that is the home base of contemporary capitalism. Its currency is the real kind of still de facto as good as gold, considered as good as gold. So that being the case, even if the U.S. manages to have some kind of a stimulus, the world economy would continue to remain sunk in uh, a crisis of overproduction in a situation of unemployment. And the third world countries in particular would remain sunk in such a situation of unemployment definitely in the foreseeable future. What they need to do to get out of this situation of crisis is to de-link themselves from this neoliberal regime, from the hegemony of globalized finance capital, and this they can do by imposing capital controls that basically do not allow finance to flow out of the country which means that the state can recapture its autonomy instead of being a prisoner to the demands and dictates of finance. It can recapture its autonomy, for which, of course, it would need an alternative social base because the corporate financial oligarchy is heavily aligned with globalized finance. This alternative political base has to come from the workers and peasants. And therefore, if you have a government that enjoys the support of the workers and peasants, one of the things it has to do is to delink itself from these global financial flows. But of course, when you, you delink yourself from global financial flows, you would find it difficult to maintain your trade deficit. So you'll have to impose some import controls as well, because you can't pay for your imports, because finance would not come into your country. Rather, it, it would be leaving your country. Even if it does not leave, it certainly would not come into your country. So you'll have to have some import controls. So again, there'd be transitional difficulties. And these transitional difficulties would actually hurt precisely the workers and peasants who are the mainstay of your support. Therefore, the two things which are very really essential, I think, in the context of the third world countries is firstly, of course, is that this has to be explained to our basic classes, classes of workers and peasants. And the second thing is that there has to be a certain amount of international solidarity behind regimes that are trying to get out of this vortex of financial flows, that are trying to improve the condition of the people, that are trying to improve the level of employment, any such regime which is trying to do this is something that must acquire international support and solidarity. You know, the, one of the most unfortunate things is that when Syriza in Greece came to power, it came to power on the promise of uh, 
not pursuing the policies which it was doing earlier. And therefore, there was a brief period during which there was a standoff between Syriza on the one hand and finance capital on the other. But during this period, when finance capital was dictating to Syriza uh, 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 a course of action, which would have gone against, which did go against what it has itself promised, there was hardly a workers' demonstration in any other country in support of Syriza, in support of the Greek workers. Now, that is sad, and therefore it's very important that we actually build up international solidarity. And, of course, we ensure that our basic classes have a certain theoretical understanding of the problems of contemporary capitalism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Patniak. You gave us a lot to consider. We'd like to open the floor for uh, uh, questions and comments now. Please uh, keep your question or comment uh, brief. And uh, you indicate that you do have a, uh, you do want to introduce a question or make a comment by clicking the raise the picture of a hand, the raise hand icon on your control. Uh, panel and then we will uh scroll through and open your um mic on our end if you want to speak please already click your mic on your end so you want to click the hand and click the mic click the hand and click the mic on your end and then i'll open your mic on my end cindy there you go cindy please you have the floor Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Putnick, uh, and all of you for this incredibly wonderful um, webinar. So based on this dynamic you describe, would you describe Franklin Roosevelt as a fascist leader? He was close enough to the capitalist interests to convince them to allow the government to spend massive amounts of money. Thank you. Okay, we'll take uh, a few more questions or comments. Scrolling through, looking for raised hands. Leonard, your mic is open on our end. Please click your mic on your control panel to, to open your mic. Leonard Yanelli. Put your mouse cursor on your mic, on your control panel, and just click it, and it will open. Leonard Yanelli, okay. He did not respond, so I will move on to the next person. We will not be able to read questions, so please. Okay, Micah Anderson, please open your mic. Put your mouse. There you are. Howdy. Um, one thing I heard, like, isn't, don't some, like, parts of the bourgeois like significant deficits in government spending because they borrow from them and it's a solid source of income because i mean maybe not all of it but that's also why people like reagan racked up such an enormous debt right okay thank you we'll take a few more Noah, speak up, please, Noah. Yeah, um, so if I'm understanding right, it, it sounds like neoliberalism and a strong state are opposing tendencies. Um, so with, with a weakening state, how is neo-fascism implemented then? Is that just a matter of, a, is it a qualitatively different state? Is it sort of the death throes of a state? Like, how can you have a weakening state and neo-fascism? That's my question. Thank you, Noah. And maybe one more, Dr. Potniak. Scott, open your mic on your, there you are. Hello, um, and thank you. Uh, I was wondering um, what role the, I know what we'll call it, the crisis of logistics, the, the shipping backlogs and all of that is uh, playing in this, this crisis of overproduction. Um, what, what um, kind of exacerbated stresses is it uh, placing on the situation? Thank you. 
Just one more, Dr. Patniak. You know, I, I, I couldn't catch the last one. I couldn't He's catch the last one. The, the, back, the, back, the backlog uh, of uh, products, the products that can't get to market because it's at the ports, the backlog at the ports. Oh, backlog, okay. Yeah, yeah. So Sharon, Sharon, speak up, please. This is the last uh, one, Dr. Thank you. Um, my question has to do with China. So when you use the term third world, people might assume that you're including China in that. But I think, I'm wondering what you think, that China is different um, because of the large state sector and the control of the Communist Party. Thank you. Uh, the control of the economy by the Communist Party. Thank you. Okay, the floor is yours, Dr. Patnik. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me just go through the questions one by one. No, I I was saying the opposite, not that FDR can be considered a fascist. On the contrary, what I was trying to say is that he actually, okay, let's just look at it in some detail, that FDR's New Deal was a way of bringing about a recovery in the United States from the depths of the depression. Therefore, he was putting forward a liberal solution, a liberal bourgeois solution to the problem of unemployment, which was different from the fascist solution, which was through militarizing the economy, as I mentioned, uh, Germany, Japan, and so on. Now, it is another thing that when the US economy had recovered somewhat from the Great Depression, there was an enormous pressure from US finance capital on FDR to actually cut back the fiscal deficit, which he did thinking that the eco economy has recovered, but that's because, because of that, the US got into another recession in 1937. So, so the point is that 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 FDR actually was trying an alternative strategy, which is an alternative to the fascist strategy for getting out of the Great Depression. The fascists were the first to get out of the Great Depression because of militarizing the economy, but uh, uh, FDR's strategy was different, though, of course, for reasons that I just mentioned, the U.S. did not get out of the recession until preparations for the war began, until, uh, you know, military spending was stepped up uh, for fear of the conflict, I mean, in anticipation of the conflict with the fascists. Uh, then the second uh, thing is, yes, it's a very important in, in, and interesting point that you see, that there is no obvious reason why finance capital should be opposed to a fiscal deficit. I, I, I mentioned that really there is no obvious economic reason, but this has been a consistent feature of finance capital. It is a feature of globalized finance. It is also a feature of the kind of finance capital uh, which had prevailed even earlier. In 1929, when the, United, when the United Kingdom, when the British economy was, had not really had 20% unemployment, but only 10%, Lloyd George, who was then the liberal leader, had actually suggested to the British government a proposal for borrowing finance public works to generate employment. It was completely shot down by the city of London, which is where the finance capital of Britain really has its base. Therefore, finance capital's opposition to a larger government spending finance through a fiscal deficit is an opposition that goes back a long way. Keynes had thought, being a liberal economist, that really once it is made clear to them why, you know, I mean, the, he, he thought this opposition was based on a wrong understanding of economic theory, that when his economic theory is made clear to everybody, then of course they would understand and they would drop that opposition, but that did not happen. That opposition persists to this day. And I, my own reading of that opposition is that because any significant state intervention 
in the functioning of a capitalist economy is something which delegitimizes capitalism. Capitalists don't mind the state intervening by giving them support. You know, when Obama was the president of the United States, he pledged $13 trillion. I'm not saying he paid. He pledged $13 trillion in order to bail out the US financial system, which was which was under great stress at that point. So they don't mind state intervention that is in the interests of, of, of directly uh, of, of finance or directly going through capital, providing incentives to capital to make, make investment, but they certainly mind direct government spending to generate employment, because that is something which has a delegitimizing effect as far as capital is concerned. Then there was a question on, um, yeah, str strong state. No, no, please. I'm not, I'm not talking, I'm, I'm drawing a distinction between neoliberal state, a neoliberal state, pre-fascist neoliberal state, and the neo-fascist neoliberal state. I'm not drawing any distinction between strong and weak states. As a matter of fact, this whole argument that neoliberalism entails a retreat of the state is a wrong argument. It entails a retreat of the state only from certain areas. The degree to which it was supporting the peasants, it was supporting the workers, it was undertaking welfare expenditures. To that extent, it represents a withdrawal. But on the other hand, it actually a neoliberal state supports monopoly capital to the hilt. Therefore, it is not a question of a, a, a strong or a weak state or a retreat of the state, nothing of that kind. But on the other hand, of course, you are absolutely right that neo-fascist state is a highly centralized state, highly powerful, strong state, and, and, and therefore there is no weakening of the state in that regard. In fact, the neo-fascist state is something which is even more centralized than the uh, pre-fascist neoliberal state. Uh, then, then there was the question of the uh, backlog. You know, the point is that you know that that if you have a tendency towards overproduction, this tendency towards overproduction would immediately, of course, make itself felt in terms of larger inventories. But of course, to the extent that business doesn't want to carry larger inventories, wants to decumulate the inventories, want to liquidate the inventories by cutting back on output, you have unemployment taking place. And therefore, the, 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 the impact of uh, an overproduction crisis takes time. To, to, to manifest itself. Similarly, there may be a backlog of investment decisions. Investment decisions which are undertaken today fructify day after tomorrow. Therefore, there would be uh, uh, some kind of a backlog of, of, of investment spending. So, so a tendency towards overproduction I'm talking about the tendency, or if you like, ex economists would call it ex ante overproduction, is something that would manifest itself over a longer period of time. But the basic logic is what I was talking about. And that basic logic, whether it plays out over a longer period of time or immediately, is something which is that it generates unemployment and, of course, unutilized capacity and so on. Finally, the question on China. Yes, of course, China is very different from the other third world countries. China, you're perfectly right, you know, I mean, has a communist party in a lead, you know, leading the economy. It still has a very significant state sector and so on. So China is not a standard third world capitalist economy, nor is China a neoliberal economy, not at all. As a matter of fact, for instance, I'll give you an example, a very concrete example. I was talking about capital flights, financial flights. Financial capital flight is so serious that, you know, in South Africa, when South Africa got liberated, there was daily huge amount of money that was flowing out of South Africa, even before Nelson Mandela became president because of in anticipation of his becoming president. So when he became president, the first thing he did 
is to appoint as his finance minister the same man who had been the finance minister under the apartheid government. So that is the kind of pressure that even someone like Nelson Mandela is subject to, to show that, no, 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 there will be a continuity as far as the economic policy is concerned. Now, China does not allow capital flights. As a matter of fact, in China, if you want to take out money, if, if an, a U.S. investor takes out money or wants to take out money, then it has to be sold to some other or, or you know, I mean, the, the, the assets which the person would be liquidating would have to be sold to some other foreign investor because of which there is no net transfer of finance out of China. In other words, that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Therefore, it is not a neoliberal economy either. It's not a capitalist economy, not a neoliberal. It's, a, it's an economy which with substantial capitalist activity but it's not a neoliberal economy. And of course, it has a substantial state sector. So I would not include China in my description of the third world. And as a result, even the political uh, uh, analysis of, of China, Communist Party and so on, has to be along a completely different line from the kind of analysis which I was doing in terms of neoliberalism leading to neo-fascism. Thank you. Okay, well, that uh, is, uh, you've responded to all of the questions that have been presented so far. I apologize to uh, others. I do see other hands up, but uh, we don't want to uh, impose too much on Dr. Potniak because we want to invite him to come back again and talk to us more about uh, imperialism and uh, the functioning of capitalism today. So whenever you can fit us into your schedule, we want you to know that we would love to have you back again. So we won't impose yes, yes. more. Uh, we thank you for your time today and uh, we extend an invitation to come back. So thank you everyone thank you. for participating. Thank you everyone for participating this morning. Hopefully Dr. Potniak will indicate to us uh, his ability to come back uh, very soon and continue these very important lessons on imperialism in, in our world today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very good much. Thank you. Thank you. I should say good night. <laughs> good day, good afternoon, good night.